um, it would be unfair not to recognize that things have changed. Um, Hafiz makes the point that when you're in a supply-constrained environment, essentially my understanding of his question is, look, in a supply-constrained environment, what is the nature of FX policy that essentially ensures a regular and substantial flow of FX? And my sense is that, as I said a minute ago, things have changed. Things have moved in the direction that some of us would like to see. Um, since about, well, okay, originally since it was 2016, when the um, liberalization of, the, of Nigeria's FX regime was approved by MPC, I think uh, around about June or thereabout. Um, but that process, um, didn't fully implement. Indeed, some some of the feedback I, I got was that MPC got scared um, and you know backtracked on it. But I don't think this is the appropriate time to start discussing that. But what's important to bear in mind is that where we are today is in a situation where at least there is a portion of FX policy making that recognizes the role of the market and therefore which is the IFD window and which is why the recovery in uh, inflows that we have seen and indeed uh, the recovery in the Nigerian markets, the, the capital markets that we have seen can be traced back to the institution of the IFD window. Now where there is still some room for improvement is in the fact that Nigeria has what's typically called an MCP, a multi-currency uh, practice where we have a, a, a series of FX rates um, ranging from, as the budget has it, 305 to what is currently is on the IRE window, which I think is about 360, you know, in the 360 neighborhood. Forgive me, since I stopped being a member of MPC, I have no longer a particular need to you know, investigate these things very, very deeply. Now, for me, that remains an issue to be dealt with. And I cannot but be um, pragmatic about this. If you want to be a purist, purist analysis says to you, one, one market, driven by the forces of demand and supply, which is where I would ideally like to see. I tell people that my own brand of economics is a very market-driven one. Indeed, my favorite economist is a guy called um, Von Hayek, um, who is a very liberal economist. But we've also got to appreciate that in Countries like Nigeria, West, especially where many of the challenges are sometimes not of our making and we are usually not even prepared for them, then we tend to be reactive. And that's now where my own challenge comes in, which was the challenge I raised when my, in my earlier discussion. That Nigeria, it would be nice to have a clarity about the objectives of FX policy. Because if the objective of FX policy, for example, is inflation management, then what you speak to is almost a continual appreciation of the currency in order to keep import, the, the transmission of import uh, price impulses to the domestic economy to, to neutralize it. But if the impulse or if the policy objective is to use FX management, in stimulating competitiveness and creating jobs, then you may have to begin to look slightly differently from an appreciation of the currency. And as it is, and don't, there's no point in you know, us ignoring this, that over the years, Nigerian policy-making establishment has tended to see a strong currency almost as evidence of national virility. And so, once that is the case, we have tended to prefer an appreciation of the currency. Now, for me, that's, no, that's not the right thing to do. But then, 
we must also deal with the argument which speaks to, yeah, yeah, but you continue to devalue the currency and we do not get the improvement in, um, in competitiveness or the improvement in outcome, sorry, in output and therefore jobs that these devaluations are supposed to herald. And my answer is really very simple. That devaluation on its own is no silver bullet. Let me repeat, devaluation on its own is no silver bullet. Devaluation as part of a hopefully potent mix of policies which speak to restoration of competitiveness. Look, we have seen countries in Asia that have deliberately weakened their currencies in order to stimulate their competitive advantage in the world. But to do that, there are some prerequisites. And Nigeria, in my view, will need to face up to these prerequisites and how we meet them. What are these prerequisites? I'm not one of those who's going to talk to you about oh, whether we're importing too much or importing too little. Sorry, I'm one of those who takes a firm view that everybody is entitled to spend their money how they like. So what are the prerequisites? If your infrastructure base makes you uncompetitive, you fix it. Now, if you're going to fix your infrastructure base and you yourself say you need $100 billion, and then you've got to create an environment where $100 billion of private money, or at least a very significant amount of that, comes into focus. If you don't, so imagine, for example, we bring money, you're a foreign investor, you bring money into infrastructure, or indeed into anything, and you're not sure what will be, will the rules when you came in be the rules when you're ready to go out? Because I, it, somebody was asking me, and I suppose innocently that, guy, see, this is your iron e window. If oil prices were to go down, would, would that window still sustain? And my answer is, fortunately, I'm no longer one of those who decides that. <laughs> when, if and when that happens, you will wait and see what the decision makers will make of it. Now, that creates a problem, especially if, as um, you know, and this is, you are looking for money that is cool money, multi-year money. So if that's what you're looking for, then you've got to be able to give me assurances on multi-year policy positions that I can plan with. So that would be one of the key challenges. Secondly, if you say you want your devaluations to give you the competitive advantages that it is supposed to deliver, how is it going to do that if your labor force is not fit for purpose? If, yeah, I, I, there was a slide which I was keeping into on Dewa and this presentation, which shows that Nigeria has a cost advantage in labor terms. In other words, labor is cheap here. Point is, labor is relatively unproductive. So it's not fit for purpose. Look, I, and I give, people think it's a, you know, not a relevant example, but for me, I'm an economist. I hire economists from time to time. Once upon a time, when I, we were trying to hire economists, you get them to sit down and write GMAT type questions, and it's kind of a battery of tests. Today, I don't bother. All we do is, before we start talking about economics, hand those who come a piece of paper. Can you write how you got here? Now, it's a very simple question. How did you arrive at this venue? Now, why, for us, it will show me if you can write. It will show me the logic of your thinking, the orderliness of your thinking process. Believe it or not, 85% of those who show up typically don't go past that. Now, what does that say? It speaks to an education system that needs to be fixed. And you know what is ironic? If today, again, we must give the government real credit. Sometime last year, there was a Federal Executive Council retreat on education. And one of the pieces that I was reading out of that was, look, we need, we need to spend money. But we need to make it clear to people that if today we started and said reform of education to achieve certain goals, this is a 20-year journey if we are consistent, continuous, and conscientious. Whereas we are in a hurry. We expect that, oh, if you say you deliver the value today, the output increases must show up tomorrow. How? 
Nigeria is beginning to look, and if she's not careful, like, you know, the, in my little village, let me translate very badly uh, an, an adage. And the adage goes thus. Imagine a village of hungry people. They're hungry. So looking for food. And an elephant, which is probably the largest amount of meat you are going to get in one form, cheerfully arrives, falls down and dies. They didn't even have to kill it. The thing just arrives, prays to God, and dies so that it will be suitable for everybody. And then the people in this village have no knife. How do they want to partake of the bounty that has been presented to them? We keep complaining. <laughs> I know, but you see, but, but see, that's the problem. The height of the elephant is bigger than what their teeth can do. <laughs> So Nigeria has got to begin to understand that there are some fundamental challenges that are not short-term fixes that need to happen. When we talk, we typically talk about infrastructure in terms of rail, in terms of road. In that. Believe it or not, the biggest single opportunity in this country is human capital development. It doesn't matter whether you talk about education, whether you talk about healthcare. And you know what is ironic? And again, we must give the government real credit. The institution of health insurance begins to mean that the human capital space, especially on the healthcare side, could see a very sharp increase, especially with the micronization of payments. In other words, you don't have to even pay all, all of it at once. You pay on a monthly basis or whatever it is. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, many years ago, Airtel, I think it was, that set up a scheme that allowed you to pay for health insurance using airtime. And so there are these constraints to our productivity. I was sharing with you one day that, look, whether we like it or not, the Chinese, over time, must hemorrhage jobs. As they shift in technology, the cost of production will rise. Indeed, figures have been put out which suggest that they probably are already hemorrhaging about 5 million jobs annually. And you know the irony. Nigeria is considered to be one of those countries that has the population that could absorb that. Guess what? She has no labor force. She has a labor force in terms of people. The UND tells us we are going to be the third largest market of people, not of spending, of people in the world. And I used to remember when, you know, in school, when they wanted to abuse you. Big for nothing. <laughs> you can't look at that. Me, big for nothing. But we are currently playing in that kind of space. There are some fundamental structural issues that deal with our productivity, which makes for an improvement in our attractiveness, which then speaks to the kind of issues that Hafiz, you know, refers to. So, Policy, in my view, is already moving, has already moved. Whether it will stay there in the event of a downturn, we will wait to see. Unfortunately, I don't even have any business in that matter. <laughs> but there are fundamental challenges which make it very difficult for Nigeria to adopt a market-driven system, simply because it's going to take a long time to fix infrastructure. 